Hey, Kareem Sirajuddin here, founder of Nude Human Consulting. The Coffee with Kareem podcast aims to provide Muslims and people of all backgrounds a space to share their life gifts, meet dynamic guests, and enhance the human experience one cup of coffee at a time. Sit back and sip. Welcome to another show of Coffee with Kareem. Today, Daniel Hakikachu joins me once again for another very interesting and deep subject. Warning, nerd alert. (laughs) We're going to be discussing uh, the idea of evolutionary biology and um, what reflections uh, we can take from this from a scientific perspective, uh, as well as a theological and Islamic perspective. Daniel, thanks again for coming on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So I wanted to, you know, first of all, I, I just got to put it out there. I'm no expert uh, in biology. I mean, my strengths are in, you know, psychology, human sciences, religious studies. And uh, I know you have a background in the philosophy of science and physics. So you probably uh, got some more concepts down than me. So I'm going to kind of be the, the guy who asks a lot of questions and, and tries to understand. So be patient with me, okay? So, Daniel, w- maybe you can start us off by, by sharing what's your understanding of biological evolution. Um, so there's two major components of evolutionary biology. One is genealogical continuity, which is this idea that everything is on the same tree of life and that there is a common ancestry of all organisms. So it means that all the animals and all the organisms that are around today are essentially cousins. They're related to each other biologically. And if you want to find the common ancestor between two species, uh, you have to you know, go back in time. And generally, the more divergent or different two organisms are the further back in time the common ancestor is. So, for example, the the common ancestor for human beings and chimpanzees is presumed to be, you know, not that far back compared to the common ancestor between human beings and cats or human beings and frogs or human beings and, and an amoeba, right? So as the two species are more divergent, the common ancestor is farther back, but everything is on the same family tree. And so that's that's one component of evolutionary biology, and it's a component that predates Darwin. It's actually an idea that has its origin uh, predating Darwin, and it was something that atheists um, and non-theists generally held as well as deists, um, they felt that this was a more naturalistic understanding of how human beings and life in general came to be. Um, Rather than divine intervention, um, you have this slow progression uh, uh, of life, and everything comes from other life. Um, So there's nothing that just spontaneously generates um, so that's that's genealogical continuity, and then the other. So that's the what basically. That's the what of evolution, and then there's the how, which is natural selection, and that's where Darwin comes in because he proposed the mechanism. So okay, we have this idea of this grand tree of life and common ancestry, genealogical continuity. How does that happen um, without God? How does that happen without a uh, designer? Um, Because when we look at animals and we look at organisms, they're so complex, there's so much diversity, um, it doesn't seem like those can naturally just come into being. Um, So given that they have the appearance appearance of design, then there must be a designer. Um, So atheists want want to reject that idea. And Darwin came along and supposedly, allegedly showed how it's possible to get design without, or seeming design without a designer. And so that's the how of uh, evolutionary theory and, and the mechanism is supposed to be natural selection, which we can, uh, I can explain as well. Yeah, so what I understood there was, it's basically a uh, 
model of trying to understand nature and the world, uh, well, excuse me, the physical world uh, and how it came to be. And from, from my understanding, it started off very simple, um, but somehow ended up being these complex organisms and forms of botany that we see around us. Is, is that one way to understand it? Yeah, I mean, in, in the beginnings um, of evolutionary theory, there was this idea of progression from more simple to more complex. Um, nowadays, that kind of gloss is not used because when, part, in big part, because when we look at the fossil record and the organisms that existed millions and even billions of years ago, they're not really less complex. Mm, that's a good point. Um, and it's hard to define what complexity really is in purely materialistic terms. It, it's kind of evaluative to say, oh, this is more complex than that, um, without appealing to like some kind of metaphysical value-based judgment so but yeah generally that's the case right well let me let me let's maybe rewind and go back to the beginning here from my understanding of what i've learned there's this idea of a primordial soup that existed on the earth and there is a um, kind of new field called abiogenesis which is research concerned with the chemical processes behind the initial formation of the simplest forms of life and obviously, this could never be observed. Um, people are trying to test it uh, in labs. You know, th this is kind of what we're taught, right? Is there was this primordial soup, and somehow here you got the first forms of life, which eventually became, you know, proteins. Uh, and as we know, proteins are responsible for a lot of what we would call organic matter. So, I mean, that's one of the things that's always confused me is how did this primordial soup even emerge something and then eventually emerge uh, and evolve to such a point of, you know, actual uh, sea life and then eventually getting onto land and becoming everything that we know on land. That That's always been really confusing or unclear to me. And again, my, my background isn't in biology, so I'm a layman when it comes to this, but but uh, maybe you can help clarify this idea of the primordial soup and, and how this um, model tries to explain how everything around us came to be. Yeah, so the idea of abiogenesis, um, it's pretty much accepted at this point that there is no explanation that we have for how life can come from non-life. And it was always assumed that, oh, well, we'll find an explanation. Like, oh, it's, you know, there are a lot of hand-waving was going on um, by a lot of the popular popularizers of evolutionary theory throughout history. Is like, oh, you know, don't worry your pretty little heads about that. You know, I'm sure if you put enough chemicals within this goop, um, it's eventually going to... Uh, you know, interact and react and you'll have all kinds of chemical reactions that will create a protein or a lipid. Um, and so that was kind of assumed, but people have been asking more earnestly, okay, well, what is the explanation? And I think um, one thing that is really telling, um, there's a, a nano engineer and a synthetic chemist named James Tour. And he is a very prominent researcher. Um, he was at Rice University. I don't know if he's still there. But he has over 500 research papers, over 100 patents. So he's really accomplished in the field of synthetic chemistry and nanoengineering. And so his whole concern is with, okay, well, how do we synthetically, you know, man-made, create simple molecules like that's his whole research focus and, and life's work. And his point, and, he, and there's a video on this, you can, go, you can see him lecture, and he, he makes this challenge. He says, if anyone can explain to me how uh, natural selection and evolutionary biology can explain how you know, these very simple building blocks of life that we know such as nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, etc. If anyone can explain how these naturally uh, came about, you know, please tell me and I'll, you know, give you a prize because so far no one has been able to explain it. And I've talked to Nobel Prize winning 
scientists, I've talked to colleagues, I've talked to people who are top of the field in evolutionary biology, and no one really knows. Um, and I'm in a good position to judge any explanation that someone offers because I'm a synthetic chemist. So creating molecules is my business, it's my job. And so he, you know, he, he has this paper actually that lays out exactly how uh, incredibly mind-bogglingly improbable it is for the right things to happen at the right time in the right conditions for even the most simple acid or protein or lipid to to generate right but but don't but isn't the often the re the rebuttal to that is well given enough time right right and this right cocktail, as you said, it's it's just a matter of statistical probability. I mean, we're talking billions of years here. Um, there is a higher chance that something can happen if you give it a long, long, long stretch of time. I mean, what do you think about that? That's usually a, a rebuttal that I've Yeah, heard. I mean, it's a pretty sloppy and uncompelling rebuttal because you're just appealing. People who say that are just appealing to big numbers and and. You know, everyone notoriously has time wrapping their heads around big numbers. Like, really, what is the difference between a billion and a trillion? What's the difference between a billion and a quadrillion? A lot, a lot of we zeros. Know that, different. <laughs> yeah, a lot of zeros, but like the actual scale of what that is. Because if you get into quadrillion years, that's more than the uh, age of the universe or the, you know, the estimated age of the universe. So, when you actually calculate the probabilities right. um, based on, you know, what a synthetic chemist is doing, right? Because he's in a good position to know how likely it is. And you can develop a probability distribution based on very controlled conditions. And he can still give you a probability or he has a better sense of, okay, what are the numbers for this to happen completely randomly? And yeah, it's true. You get, you have enough time and you, it can happen, but if that time scale is, um, you know, a billion times more than the age of the universe, then that, so what? Like, it doesn't prove anything. And I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a not, there's more to say about that actually, because if you think about like an analogy that people give is, well, if you have a junkyard, just a junkyard in the middle of nowhere, give it enough time right? Billions of years. And eventually you can have a fully functional jumbo jet 747 commercial airliner come out of that mess, right? Just give it enough time. Just give it enough time, right? That, and it, that seems to make sense, right? But there's another layer to that because if you look at a jumbo jet, okay, even that, like we would say that would take billions of years, but a jumbo jet, it would just take, it's taken engineers, like the actual development of the 747 that Boeing produces, that development took around 10 years for them from the beginning to the end of developing that. And you had the best scientists, you had the best engineers working to develop this jet. But when you look at even the simplest cells and the simplest proteins, not even, you know, all of the greatest scientists have been able to produce anything like a cell, you have scientists with extreme difficulty trying to create even synthetic molecules, which are not even on the same order of magnitude as proteins and then cells. So you have even, you know, the best intellects trying to deliberately design something are not able to do it in highly controlled environments but supposedly, you know, something randomly happen, happening is supposed to outdo uh, and outsmart all of this collective intelligence that's working towards a goal. The 747, yeah, humans have been able to uh, design and create that. And it took 10 years of deliberate design. And we're granting that it would take billions of years for that to randomly happen. So what about something that humans can't even generate, that can't even put together uh, currently with all these resources because people have tried, right? There's a lot of incentive to try to do this and no one has even come close. So that I think speaks more to uh, the order of magnitude and, and the size of the numbers that we're talking about 
whenever someone says, oh, just give it enough, enough time, it'll happen, we should interrogate that and look a little bit closer because it's a it's fuzzy math. Yeah, I mean, I, I could certainly hear some people go, well, it's, you know, it's a matter of we still don't know. We haven't discovered it yet, but but science will you know, one day show us how inshallah, that works. Inshallah. And that's sometimes what we hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, inshallah. Uh, inshallah. Of faith. Be open to it. But but right, it's it, it does require a lot of, I would certainly argue, imagination and faith, just like somebody believing in, you know, God or or or, or you know, other things that you can't uh, directly prove yet, you know, through um empiricism, etc. Yeah, I don't think that there is I think there is evidence and we talked about this on the other podcast, um, empirical evidence of God. And yeah, I was speaking. I was speaking more from uh, from kind of the the atheist lens. You know, like that would that would usually be the response from people I've spoken to. But you know what? What came up for me though when you were discussing this, and and those are really good, you know, questions, right? Like, how could we really um, accept something like that? The intellect just naturally thinks it's far-fetched. I mean, if you give it reflection. And this kind of brings up this other idea of this concept of fine-tuning in the universe, because there are physicists and scientists that say, you know, well, if we accept that, you know, there's all these coincidental and very lucky accidents, we're, we're basically relying on a lot of luck when it comes to understanding all this stuff happening. Um, and on the other end, I mean, isn't it also very plausible to suppose that these things were not accidents, but happened according to some design and plan, and, and there's some intelligent consciousness behind it? Well, when it comes to tuning of the universe, you know, again, the probabilities are so ridiculous um, that they're mind-boggling. And for the, the different um, constants, like the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the Planck's constant, all of these physical variables, for them to all be at the exact right amount for there to even be um, stars or let alone planets, let alone water, let alone carbon, let alone life. Um, again, like the probabilities are so mind boggling. So how when human beings see these like very improbable things happening you you know it's just intuitive to think well this was intentional and there has to be something else a, a greater force that is uh, designing and is generating this creating this that's just a very natural uh, that's the way the human mind works right and so the way that uh, atheists and evolutionists want to dispute that is by saying, well, no, it's all random. You just have to have enough of a time scale, right? All of their arguments boil down to that. And this is also the response that they give when, for fine tuning. They're like, they say, well, you know, yeah, it seems like it's all been perfectly designed, but that's because there's an infinite number of universes and we just happen to be living in one that is conducive to life. Right, so this is the explanation they they give. They appeal to this idea of the multiverse, and the multiverse is actually very popular because you know uh, you know I went uh, to Harvard for undergrad and I had physics professors who would talk about this fine tuning, and they would admit you know in class that you know this is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, and why you know they didn't say why, but it's okay. You've lived your life as an atheist and not believing in the higher power, not believing in God, thinking that it's that it's irrational. But then you have all of these signs and all of this evidence that okay, well, how can it be explained? Um, so there was a state before this kind of multiverse idea of infinite number of universes besides our own. Before that came into vogue, there was a crisis, an existential crisis amongst a lot of physicists and, you know, they might have admitted it, you know, during office hours or class time, but it wasn't like very publicized, right? There's, you don't want to show a chink uh, uh, in the armor of atheism and naturalism. But anyway, long story short is that they propose this infinite number of universes. Okay, well, what's the evidence? What's the empirical evidence for these universes outside and outside in quotes and air quotes because okay what does outside even mean you know if you have the idea of the universe what does outside of it mean um what is the empirical evidence for that 
And of course there's none, um, but it's just assumed like, okay, well, there's no way, other way to explain it. So we have to appeal to the multiverse. Well, no, there is another way to explain it. <laughs> it's called uh, theology. It's called God. It's called uh, a higher power. And so if you, and it's far more plausible or fine, we'll, we'll get, you know, best case scenario for the atheist. It, it's equally plausible. Okay, because if you want to say that, okay, this is something outside the universe, because as far as theology is concerned, God, uh, even Islamically, God is not created. He is not part of the creation. Um, so as far as a, if you want to be a strict empiricist and say, oh, okay, well, God is outside the universe, just like these other multiverses would be, uh, these other universes would be, then as far as the atheist is concerned, probability distribution is equally plausible. Um, so, I mean, that's where it is. They'll try to argue against that, but I don't see how they can escape that conclusion. Yeah, I mean, I, I always felt like this idea of multiverse was just trying to explain away the probability of an intentional uh, initiator. For the universe, because obviously this idea of the universe having a beginning, which is very um, clear, according to, to most physicists and astrophysicists, uh, it's like, OK, well, what made the Big Bang go bang? And in order to solve that, it's like, oh, well, it was born out of some other universe. OK, so you're still giving it a cause that we can't directly access similar to God. Uh, I've also heard, you know, when it comes to this primordial soup, um, you know, some, some views are saying, well, maybe there's extraterrestrial higher intelligence that kind of planted us here. Okay. So you're still giving the reason or the cause to something of higher intelligence. You just don't want to give it to this concept of a divine. And it's like, you still keep hitting the same wall. Uh, I feel like when, when you talk about these types of things. And, I mean, from the Islamic perspective, we do believe in several universes, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Saba Samawat. But uh, that doesn't mean that these are the... Um, this is what gave birth to what exists. I mean, you're still giving the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a Muslim perspective to something in creation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's... I, I haven't seen anyone be able to get around that wall um and this is not new like uh, philosophers of the past recognize that there is this wall and that's what became the basis for many of the arguments for god um across uh, religions even you know you have the kalam argument um you have and then you have other thinkers that use different versions of it you can argue that descartes for example used a kind of version of that. You have Leibniz, um, German philosopher, who also um, seemed to have a version of that kind of argument. Um, but it all goes back to, I mean, there's very, very many paths to that same conclusion. Right. And it's also interesting that, um, you know, when it comes to everything in our existence, whether it's an iPhone or a water bottle, nobody would just except that, oh, this kind of formed because for millions or billions of years, uh, you know, some junkyard put this iPhone together for us. And, uh, and of course, you know, the atheist might say, well, it's not quite like that, Kareem. You know, there is natural selection. There is this kind of force uh, that's, that's acting upon what exists. But then I ask, okay, um, in order for evolution to actually exist, it requires existence of something that can make copies of itself randomness can only be understood if it was contrary to some sense of or organization, right? Am, am I wrong about that? Right, yeah. It goes back to the discussion we just had on abiogenesis, right? They're, you know, atheists are just pushing back the problem, right? They're saying, oh, well, there is an explanation. And, you know, they just push the problem back, but ultimately it leads to this question of, okay, well, how did life come from non-life? at that molecular molecular level and they admit that it's a mystery so you haven't really explained anything you haven't really provided much of an explanation naturally naturalistically for the origin of life the origin of complexity of life diversity of life and so on and so forth right what would you say are some of the other big uh questions uh in, in evolutionary biology that you know other scientists have voiced uh, well, um, there are a lot of questions. 
Uh, I think some of the things that are most relevant are, you know, understanding the fossil record and, and whether the fossil record supports gradual change um, over time or not. Um, there are questions re regarding why um, certain parts of the genetic code are um, have components that don't have anything to do with the organism itself, right? Like, so you have fish, right. as an example, like fish that have genes that are found in birds, um, and th those genes are associated with growing, you know, talons, for example, or beaks. So why does a fish have that? So, okay, well, maybe there is some common ancestor, but no, like that doesn't match the phylogenetic tree that we assume fish and birds to be on or, you know, those, um, uh, those families of the species. So there's all of all kinds of questions around that, um, that have, that has given rise to entire disciplines within sub disciplines within evolutionary biology. Um, there's evolutionary development, um, biology within the, the larger field that looks at, okay, well, maybe there, these common ancestors had pretty built out um, gene packages. And as they evolved or as, they, as the organisms themselves moved to different parts of the world and different environments or climate changed, then those different parts of the gene would be triggered. And so you have the same gene, but if you're on land, it creates legs instead of fins or, you know, different parts of the gene of the, of the genome are triggered um, based on the environment. And so this is called evolutionary development biology, but it speaks against natural selection because the whole idea of natural selection is that the environment, all, all the gene does, all the genome does is mutate randomly. That's the random component. Most of those mutations are maladaptive, meaning they don't help the organism, but a small percentage are adaptive, meaning they're beneficial to the organism. And then, so those organisms that have the adaptive genes uh, or the adaptive part of their genetic code they're selected and so they're able to pass on uh, those genetics to their offspring and so on. Um, so it's the environment. It's not like those advanced aspects of the gene exist prior and then they just need to be triggered, right? That goes completely against um, this idea of random mutation then being filtered or selected by the environment. It's a completely complete inversion inversion of Darwinian natural selection. And there's that. And then there's also all kinds of discussion around epigenetics, which is that you can have two organisms, which ha when you look at the genetic level, um, their genomes are very similar and they share a lot of the same genes and the same gene structures, but the phenotypes, meaning the actual, you know, the actual organism itself the two are very different, even though they have the same genotype. So how is that? Like, why, what is affecting, because there seems, there's a very reductive view of organisms that, okay, well, you have the gene, genes, and you have the genome, and that's the blueprint of the organism. So if you have two organisms with the, with the same DNA and the same genotype, then that means they're going to be the same organism. They're going to have the same phenotype, you know, the physical characteristics. Um, but that's not the case. You have very similar genotypes, shared genes, but very different phenotypes. And so it's not understood, like, what is affecting that? Because as far as the previous evolutionary biology was concerned, it was just, you know, random mutations filtered by the environment. And then you have selection, um, positive selection for certain phenotypes. Um, but so these are some of the questions that have really rocked the field of evolutionary biology. If you're on the outside, 
you don't really get a sense of that. You don't really get a sense of, okay, this is not established science. Whenever you have debates between like Christians and evolutionists, the one side always makes it seem like, oh, the science is solid. You know, there's no question of how human beings evolved and how organisms evolved. It's just a matter of, you know, finding details here and there. You know, we haven't worked out all the details, but overall we have a, you know, a solid understanding of how all of this works. But if you actually go behind the scenes, it's a very different picture. Um, and you'd be surprised at the, the kinds of open questions that are being discussed. And it's even the entire uh, idea, as I said, of whether natural selection is the main component of, of evolution. That's in question, right? Because it seems like epigenetics plays a much greater factor. It seems like there's other forces with on the level of DNA and RNA um, that affect how uh, genes uh, create proteins and then, you know, form cells and form the organism. Those are all open questions and it doesn't seem like natural selection uh, insofar as we think that no natural selection is a coherent concept anyway, which I don't believe. And that's further discussion. But even if we don't do, if we do think that natural selection and Darwinism makes sense at this point, evolutionary biologists have, are coming to a consensus that it's not even that big of a deal as far as how organisms develop and species are originated. That's a pretty big deal, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah. my, my understanding is, okay, so natural selection is this, um, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have any foresight or conscious motives. It, it simply somehow favors certain beneficial genetic traits that already exist within a population and it's somehow favored by you know the the environmental i don't know interaction if you will or, or cues and, and this is how these certain beneficial traits um from mutations are more likely to survive and be passed on uh through breeding within that population but i still am very confused as to how do you have something like DNA, which is called a code and an instruction for the building blocks of organisms? How did this even come to be? And how does it even know how to replicate? And also what I've learned was that these mutations happen at a very, very small uh, percentage, or it's at kind of an impressive uh, minimum, so to speak. Um, but without those variations, we wouldn't get the diversification and branching out of certain uh, populations. But again, I, I just keep hearing like, well, it sounds like there's a lot of design here, right? Even from the perspective of uh, evolutionary biology. And I still get kind of confused of how do we accept all these things? But then, you know, we also fall back on these ideas of um, well, nothing about it is conscious, but yet there's some kind of favoring, you know, through natural selection. Um, why is it that certain traits are identified by the species as more favorable or not and may increase the likelihood of breeding with those organisms that have those things? I mean, I, I'm a little confused with all that. And uh, I'm wondering um, if you can maybe simplify it for us, this idea of heredity, mutations, and, and copying uh, of the genes because I just feel like there's something going on here besides, you know, the luck of the draw or, or trial and error. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Well, if we go to the basic idea of natural selection, it's supposed to be very intuitive and logical. And that's why it's been so successful. Um, but if you go into the details of it, that's where there's problems. And there have been different philosophers and also um, biologists who have been pointing some of these uh, contradictions out. But um, we can like, you know, the very standard explanation or example that's given um, of a peppered moth, for example. So this is a moth um, that's in England. Um, and prior to the industrial revolution, these moths were more light colored. They're more white and, and had, you know, uh, spots on them, black spots. And these moths lived in the forests when 
the Industrial Revolution happened, you'd have more smog, there was more pollution, and this affected the coloring of the tree that where the moths lived, their habitat. And the trees became darker with smog. They used to be whiter, lighter in color and shade, and then they became darker. And then what was discovered is that, okay, well, these peppered moths, now when we look at the peppered moth population, most of them are darker. They're grayer. Instead of being a lighter white, they're grayer and darker. And so there's been this change um, in the phenotype and the characteristic of the moth's wings in their color. And it's because of this is natural selection and action. Why? Because now the moths, when the trees changed color due to uh, pollution, the moths uh, that were brightly colored were easily seen by predators like birds. And so birds came and ate those um, moths at a higher frequency, at a higher rate. And so they had they were had less uh, reproductive advantage in order to spread those genes responsible for a white uh, or, or lighter colored wings. But those mm-hmm. moths that due to mutation had darker wings that blended in and camouflaged with the trees better, predators had a hard time finding them, hunting them. So those moths were more reproductively successful and were able to pass the dark colored um the genes responsible for dark colored wings to their offspring and so that um phenotype proliferated in the population until the population as a whole became more dark in coloring and so this sounds like a very logical this sounds like a very logical explanation of okay yeah that makes sense like how can you dispute that right the problem is that you can point to anything within the environment as causing anything else. And what I mean by that is you have the same kind of explanation for, well, you have moths, right, that are camouflaging, but then what about certain bird species that are very brightly colored? And you have peacocks and you have toucans and parrots and they're so brightly colored. Oh, well, you know, that's also adaptive to be brightly colored because it helps you attract mates. Um, And so you have two different evolutionary explanations for how, okay, one species developed more camouflage. Right. And that changed, you know, its coloring. And then you base it on, okay, hiding from predators Whereas this other species is brightly colored, so you have a convenient explanation for that as well. Oh, it's to find a better mate. Um, So there's always going to be, for any change, you can always give an uh, evolutionary explanation. Um, And that's bad, (laughs) because it means that um, the theory is is vacuous, uh, because it can explain everything it doesn't matter like and so and therefore it's not predictive like you don't know why uh it's really the case that these moths are uh, a certain color or have certain structures or any other organism because you can always have a just so story right and there's no way to like go back and you know determine what is what it was actually that caused these changes um, and so for an, an analogy of that, so these are historical explanations, right? Because imagine, here's an example. Why did Donald Trump win uh, the election, for example? This is a question, and you can give, there's so many different factors that conceivably could have affected that, but it's just a post hoc explanation. Like that election has already happened and so you can always and there's you know thousands of different explanations all kinds of political analysis has been done oh it was because people were racist oh it was because of the economy oh it was because hillary was so incompetent there's all these causal explanations or seemingly causal explanations but they're just post hoc after you know the outcome after you know what has happened it's very easy to concoct an explanation for why that's the case and that's what all of 
natural selection, uh, an explanation appealing to natural selection is. It's, okay, we have the result. You have birds that are brightly colored. You have moths that are uh, that camouflage. You have big uh, animals. Uh, you have small animals. You have animals with sharp teeth. You have animals with great vision. Um, you have all these different uh, traits that organisms within the animal kingdom uh, display and express, but you know you can attribute those to any number of the infinite number of uh, environmental factors of in which those organisms live now and in the past. So this is not like this is not science. Okay, this is not like you're not predicting how moths will look like in 100 years or any other or next year right mm-hmm. because it's dependent on all these factors so it's a non-explanation and it's non-science and you know this is a kind of argument that um, you can read by uh, it's a book called by Jerry Fodor he's a philosopher and he's also an atheist and he wrote a book called uh, what Darwin got wrong and it was a very controversial book. And he makes this argument. And he's an atheist. Mm-hmm. He's coming from a philosophy of science background, but he co-wrote it with a professor of biology. And their whole argument is that, look, there's something deeply wrong with this idea of natural selection. And we need to – we're atheists. We're not saying that, okay, this is evidence of God or this is something that uh, lends credibility to theism. but you know, as scientists or as rational naturalists, we need to get our house in order. We need to really figure out what's going on because this is not a good explanation. <laughs> this is not a good, this is not science. And so if you're interested, like in reading this argument in depth, mm-hmm. I'd recommend that book. And it's very interesting. Right. Yeah, for sure. So just to kind of summarize, so, so far we talked about, you know, the, one of the big questions obviously, is how did the universe get here? But we're not going to dive into that too much today. But more so, how did living organisms get here on Earth? And this primordial soup, um, and it's still a huge mystery, and there's still a lot of uh, research that is taking place, and it's obviously something that can never directly be observed. We also have things like the fossil records and these other examples, like the peppered moth, and and, um, things that some scientists would argue are observable, uh, evolutionary processes. Um, but let's say, you know, all right, we say, all right, I don't know about natural selection or some of these mechanisms that have been defined, but how would you make sense of all the data and evidence that evolutionary biology does build off of, like the fossil records or um, uh, these types of things which they claim supports the model? Yeah, so undoubtedly there's a lot of data. Um, there's a lot of scientific work that's been done Um, but all of the data is what I call local problem solving in the sense that you have scientists focusing on one organism, one, you know, trade characteristic behavior of a particular organism, and they've compiled a lot of data here and there, very locally, very, uh, contained. Um, but the bigger questions and the bigger picture Um, that is supposed to explain everything and and make sense of it all, there's not much that's been done on that level. There's not much that's been proven on that level. Um, We've already talked about abiogenesis, right, Uh, and what synthetic chemists think of this idea of life from non-life and whether it's really something that we are able to conceptualize even, let alone prove. Um, but even, you know, more fundamental questions like, well, why are, is, well, not more fundamental questions, but equally fundamental questions like, well, why is, why do we have sexes? Like, why are there two sexes, male and female, generally speaking? Like, why is that necessary? Like, what is the reproductive advantage that, um, confers that kind of characteristic of organisms? Why do things have to re- reproduce sexually as opposed to asexually or non-sexually? Um, these are questions that, again, you can speculate. <laughs> there's plenty of speculation, but there's not really any 
uh, established answer that makes sense or that's been proven in any way. Uh, um, you have all these kinds of issues on the global level when we're talking about the bigger picture, the bigger ideas, and the evidence is not there. You can show you know, in a lab plenty of examples of how fruit flies can you know, grow different kinds of wings or not develop wings or be born without eyes or have like different kinds of anatomical structures. But there's not, you know, those are all micro phenomenon, micro evolution. Um, plenty of data on that. Plenty of scientists have been working on that for, for years, decades. Um, but again, the bigger issues, um, there are, there are a lot, there's more questions than answers by far. Um, but again, the rhetoric and the actual discussion that happens in public between theists and atheists, evolutionists and creationists is whenever evolutionists want to claim that, oh, our stuff is solid and we know what we're talking about, we have all this evidence, all the examples are usually, you know, they direct your attention to all these local examples and this local body of data. And so there's a lot of equivocation, right? Um, so that people think, oh, yeah, well, there is all this data. There is all this evidence. Um, and not real realize that behind the scenes, there's all this questioning and even crises within the discipline. Okay, Daniel. I mean, I, I hear that. You, th you make a lot of good points. But, you know, there are Muslims that believe in Allah. They believe in his messenger. And they are like, hey, I don't have a problem with evolutionary biology. In fact, um, you know, they would argue that if it's, if it's a model of science that seems to be pretty valid, at least as far as, you know, how organisms came to be, why can't we just accept that maybe that's the way Allah decided to create it? You know, there is this idea of gradualism in the universe. Um, this is, uh, you know, no, I don't think any wise Muslim will say, you know, the earth is only 7,000 years old or whatever. Uh, there is a lot of data to support how long um, the earth has been here, how long the universe has been evolving, so to speak. I mean, can't Muslims still believe in aspects of evolutionary biology, if not the whole model, at least when it comes to uh, how all species came to be? And we can maybe talk about the idea of human beings and, and the creation of Adam um, as well. But why why would this be an issue for some Muslims to actually say, I believe in evolutionary biology. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I find the evidence to be compelling and not necessarily taking away from the uh, qudra or the power or decision making of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, Allah also creates and does what he wills and how he pleases when he wants. And why couldn't this just be uh, understood as, as a process uh, like that? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so So far, we've just been talking about how compelling evolutionary biology is on its own terms outside of the theological questions and the specific questions with Islam. Um, but if we look at whether evolutionary biology can be reconciled with Islam, there's problems. Um, there's points of irre irreconcilable conflict. Um, and it's very clear, um, and I can you know mention, there's two main problems. Um, one is this idea of uh, human origin, right? Because Islamically, um, we know that Adam alayhi salam, uh, did not have parents, right? Um, he did not have mm. a biological birth. And that's, as far as all the tafasir are concerned, that's solid knowledge, right? Um, and that's how Everyone has understood, you know, the story of Adam in the Quran and in Hadith is that he did not have a biological birth. Um, just like Isa, Isam, Jesus Christ did not have a father. Um, Adam, Isam did not have a father or a mother, right? Um, so this is big problem as far as evolutionary biology is concerned because all life is from life. Right, that's the basic naturalistic mm. assumption. You can't have spontaneous generation. You can't have something just coming out of nothing, much less a um, advanced, you know, quote 
quote-unquote advanced organism like a human being or even, you know, a, a multi-celled organism. So that's one area of direct irreconcilable conflict. You can't believe... Um, you can't believe in the story of Adam, ISM, and also accept the naturalistic perspective uh, on life and the origin of species. Um, now, people might say that, so Muslims might say, well, why don't we look at it as a miracle, right? Maybe evolutionary biology, um, natural selection, everything else that scientists are discussing Maybe that's you know the standard for life normally, um, and how things originate and evolve. And humans are just special. Adam was a miracle, and um, he's he was just created in in a spe- as a special creation as opposed to other things like chimpanzees or or whatever else. Um, the problem with this, however, is that it conflicts with another well-established point of evolutionary biology um, called uh, polygenism. What's that? Okay, polygenism. Yeah, so it's not it's not like polygamy. Okay. Um, but it's uh, polygenism is this idea that the earliest human population from which all humans come from, like descended from, had multiple, you know, had several thousand members. So basically humans couldn't have Mm -hmm. descended from a single man and woman, right? Um, And what this means and and how this is determined is that um, you have geneticists looking at the human genome and uh, not only the human genome, but looking at actual genetic profiles of different human beings across the world. And based on the differences between those different genetic profiles, they can um, they can uh, project back in time to say, okay, this is what the population of human beings was at this time, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, five hundred thousand, two million years ago. Um, they can project that, um, and we can talk about their methods because um, there's a lot of juicy stuff there, but. Based on that, there's no way that human the human population, based on the genetic code that we see, could have originated from just an Adam and Eve, right? So that's another hmm. direct conflict, and it that conflict also you know cuts to this idea of okay, the miraculous origin of Adam, ISM, and you would have to say that yeah. Um, not only the origin and creation of Adam and Eve was and how well were uh, miraculous, but also the way that the genetics, their genetics was, was also miraculously in a way that would lead to the conclusion that, okay, what scientists are seeing today of there being um, a initial human population of several thousand members polygenism so does this does this imply that this this kind of notion of one day this set of homo sapiens you know branched out uniquely and then from there came all the ho- the humans um this kind of denies this and says no there were probably branches and pockets of populations that were were kind of um uh, arising all over the place is is that is that right or or not necessarily all over the place. Um, it's not. It's not parallel evolution. It's just okay. You have, um, you have this new species that's uh, arising um, because of muta- uh, mutations and epigenetic uh, epigenetics and other forces um, that are causing this new uh, species called Homo sapien. But it's not just like one couple, uh, a male and a female. It's happening to several thousand members like there's an entire population the first human beings and they're all in the same geographical location um and then you have other like you have neanderthals who also have evolved or branched out branched off from the common ancestor again and they might have you know these two uh, species might have mated and so there's all kinds of explanations for 
trying to interpret the genetics that people have today across the world, as well as explaining the fossil record, because you have to have those two things match. And that causes all kinds of problems because sometimes they don't match. And I already mentioned like some of the problems with phylogenetics and trying to match you know, the uh, evolutionary tree to the actual gene genes of a specific organism. Um, so it right. becomes a very complicated matching game. But uh, as far as you know, we're concerned, it's it's all speculation at this point because it's constantly changing. Like the the right. uh, history of the human population is constantly changing based on new fossils that are found as well as new developments in genetics. Um, wow. Yeah. And so every, like pretty much on a weekly basis, you can guarantee that there's going to be some new discovery that's going to challenge the, uh, the timeline for human development. Literally, like if you go into Google right now and look up, you know, groundbreaking discovery and evolutionary human history, pretty much like clockwork, you'll find all of these new uh, discoveries coming out on a regular basis. And what that tells us is that like that's how little the field is actually developed, because if you have an established field of knowledge, um, you know, like in physics, in physics, there is not a groundbreaking discovery uh, every century, right? Or maybe you know every decade, you can hardly find a big discovery that changes physics as we know it or chemistry as we know it. Um, but right. when it comes to evolutionary biology, every week, like there's a new like groundbreaking uh, discovery, and that tells us that it's not like the the field itself is not <laughs> very complete. Because, you, right. you, you know, there's only so much information that's available, but it's made to seem like, oh, yeah, we have such a solid understanding of these phenomenon and this history. But it's it's all propaganda as far as I can tell. I see. So it is difficult to claim solid validity when the field itself is always changing and um, uh, causing deeper questions and even uh, awakening to certain things we're still ignorant about. Yeah, of um, course. Now, so let's let me try to kind of frame this. So it sounds like there's almost like three possibilities for, you know, the believing Muslim. The first possibility is I accept evolutionary biology as it is, you know, dictated in science because it's just rational to me. It makes sense. Um, but I believe that Adam uh, was created specially by God and inserted on the earth at some point. Uh, a second position could be. I believe in evolutionary biology as science dictates. And I also believe that Adam evolved just like other species. And at some point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew the soul into this creature. And this is what is also known as ensoulment. And then there's the third position of, you know, what you might call um, creationism, which is that, you know, I don't buy evolutionary biology. Uh, I accept, you know, everything uh, in the Quran and Sunnah as as literal, and I don't even investigate um, evolutionary biology and and think that it has anything to offer because this is a matter of theology, not science, and um, science can't prove theology, and theology can't necessarily prove science. So I'm just going to keep them separate, and I'm just going to accept uh, the the creation narrative as it is. Uh, even though that makes a lot of sense for people too, uh, unto itself. Uh, but it sounds like maybe those are the three possibilities that a Muslim could take today. Am I missing uh, another option? Or would you say those are uh, three likely positions to have today? Yeah, those are, th I think, the three main positions. If you think, well, uh, do you say three or four? So you can, the one, the one position that you said where um, the ensoulment view Right, that um, humans evolved exactly as evolutionary biology describes, but God selected one individual or two individuals to blow in, into them their souls, and they became the first human beings. Um, that, I think, is contrary to um, Islamic evidence and, and agreed upon position in that Adam ISM did not have a biological birth. He did not have parents, right? Um, so that's a physical thing 
at being born right. and having parents. Um, so that physical fact um, right. that Islam claims happened, um, that you have the first human being not being born biologically, there's a contradiction there, right? So you'd have to stray from the consensus of view and the established position in Islam that Adam was not born. It's a, yeah, if I may add, it's irreconcilable because, like you said, there's just a lot of evidence in the Islamic tradition. For instance, Allah SWT says he created Adam from his own hands, own two hands, right? This is a very unique um, uh, status or honor. Um, you have the idea, as you said, where, you know, Maryam, uh, peace be upon her, you know, when when Gabriel came to her and said, you will have a son, she said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? She obviously recognizes that to procreate, you need uh, a man present. And Allah said, you know, if I want this to be, it will be. And and it, and it happens. Same thing with Adam, Adisam. You have numerous hadiths where Adam is referred to by the Prophet, Sallallahu and Musa, Adisam, as the father of human beings, right? For instance, the hadith of the day of resurrection. You know, people will go to Adam and say, you're the father of all of us. You're the one who Allah gave paradise to, you know, intercede. So there's clear evidence in the literature that Adam a.s. was unique and his status was like no other because he was not born of any parents. This is very difficult to argue against, you're saying. And that's why the insolment position um, from a theological perspective is highly unlikely, if not false. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can definitely um, get into all of the ayat and the hadith um, that established this. Um, I'm, gr- I'm glad that you mentioned all of those points. And there's many others as well. Um, but there's also um, inconsistency with the idea itself. Um, because, you know, the idea of as, why would even someone resort to this kind of explanation for the origins of human beings? Like, okay, you de- everything develops naturalistically just as evolution describes. And then there's just one point where God uh, insoles one, uh, one organism who becomes Adam. Right. Why would you even appeal to that? Because as far as naturalism concern, is concerned, it's not just the human body, like the physical body that has originated naturalistically through evolution, but also the human mind and also language and thought and all of all of the things consciousness, that consciousness, yeah. consciousness, all the things that make itself, us yeah. human. That's also they ha- they claim has a naturalistic explanation. So ultimately, you're still violating naturalism by appealing to this concept of ensoulment. So if you're so if you're willing to violate naturalism in that instance, why don't you just violate naturalism entirely and say that okay, well the, the Adam himself did not have any biological antecedents. Um I think it, uh, there's a logical problem in inconsistency with the ensoulment in- view in itself. What about, okay, but what about the second uh, possible position, which is, I believe God created the, uh, na- you know, he created natural selection and evolution as a divine, quote unquote, force to make everything evolve the way it did. But then he created Adam, alayhi salam, separately and uniquely in paradise. And then Adam descended here. And that's how we started. W- why would that be a problem? Or can that also be um, more of a middle way? Why or why not? Yeah, because the as we discussed, like the science itself has a lot of holes, has a lot of problems, has a lot of contradictions. Like the first half of our conversation was just about all of those um, problems. So I don't understand why, and, or I'm saying, I, I guess I do understand why it's just that Muslims have so much faith in evolutionary biology and the scientific process as a whole and scientific consensus as a whole. Um, and, what I my what I have tried to get across in this talk and also in many of my writings is that that's misplaced faith and confidence. Um, and if you actually look at the discussions that even non-Muslims, non uh, non theists are having, they're bringing up all these questions and and challenging um, natural selection and evolutionary biology at this fundamental level. So why should Muslims have this confidence in this process that's being uh, refuted and critiqued as we speak. Like it, do, it doesn't speak very highly of 
collective Muslim intelligence. Um, that our philo- our approach to this subject is so predicated on having faith in something that others have had no problems or trouble uh, intelligently, rationally critiquing. Like, are we that anti-intellectual? Are we right. that anti-rational that we just accept whatever uh, the most, you know, be, because in, as far as public discourse is concerned, uh, you have the rational side and you have the irrational or even anti-rational side. Like, that's the stereotype of the Bible-thumping creationist um, and so we can't buy into that dichotomy, right? The, in, in truth, you have many Christian thinkers, philosophers, scientists, biologists um, who have provided critiques. And just like you have atheists who have provided those critiques, and they're very compelling. They're, they're not obviously irrational or anti-rational at all. So we don't, uh, Muslims right. just, uh, I feel oftentimes when I have these discussions with otherwise very intelligent people have this kind of knee jerk that they don't want to fall on the wrong side um, and, and throw, you know, their hat in with the irrational Bible thumpers. No, we're Muslims. We're, you know, uh, you know <laughs> uh, we, uh, we discovered science and, and we have a thousand and one inventions and we're very, you know, we're very pro science and they they go out of their way to kind of, uh, show how committed they are to this idea of science, even though they, they themselves might have <laughs> A degree in like something that's not scientific at all, but there's still this kind of allegiance to science that's very misplaced and very anti-intellectual. Yeah, and being being um, committed to science was something that Islamic civilizations exemplified. And being committed to science is not the same thing as uh, I'm committed to certain models of science, which may not be very valid or rational. I mean, you can still be scientific and not accept the dominant ideology on a certain thing in science, right? And one of my professors in grad school, he said, science in reality can't prove anything. All it can do is provide compelling evidence for a particular position about reality, but that can also change, as we know, you know, from Newtonian world uh, of physics to Einstein and, and beyond. I mean, it's. I think it's part of that humility that you find amongst you know, uh, believing or non-believing scientists, uh, some scientists really recognize like we have to be humble here and keep asking the questions and doing the research. And we shouldn't crystallize something unless, like you said, there just hasn't been any major uh, discoveries, right, um, to to uh, indicate otherwise. Now, this kind of moves to the third position, though, right? This idea of creationism. And I don't like that word. Uh, and I don't mean creationism in the sense of like, you know, these uh, ignorant Muslims who are like, oh, the world is flat, you know, because Allah says in the Quran, we, we spread the world flat. I've actually met Muslims who believe that uh, in the past. <laughs> you know, they're like, Muslims, wow. Yeah, you know, it's, you it's know, you know uh, Kyrie Irving, the basketball player for the Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> he said that? Yeah, he, I don't know if he, he was trolling, but... Uh, uh, this past year, this past season, like he was interviewed and he was like, yeah, I don't, I believe in a flat earth. <laughs> and it became this running joke that Kai Rivering, this uh, famous basketball player in the NBA thinks that the earth is flat, but he's constantly flying around the world for playing basketball. <laughs> no, it's hilarious. I mean, I, when I was young, I used to attend this like Halakha with certain um, group of teachers and Muslims. And, um, you know, they, they had some views that I would uh, consider to be um, imbalanced, to say the least, and, and uh, unhealthy. This was, yeah. And so, and so I, I remember attending uh, these Halakhas and, you know, I have a lot of stories about it, a lot of trauma. But um, what was funny is, I, I don't, I may have mentioned this before, my father, he, he's a PhD in physics, mashallah, and he was a professor in, in physics and mathematics and, and, um, uh, and so he knows his stuff when it comes to hard science. And so one day I went home and I was like, Dad, today they taught us that the earth is flat. And he's like, you're never going back to those holocausts again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so it's not about that. Like when I say creationism, I don't mean this type of um, ignorance, which is devoid of any scientific inquiry or, or evidence. But let's say more this idea of intelligent design or a divine uh, cause, uh, a consciousness behind the universe. Uh, this is is, um, I think, a better way to frame it. So can you tell us more about that and and, and uh, what your thoughts are about this position and what it would look like, accepting that, you know, Allah created everything the way he wanted, including Adam's unique creation, including, you know, the way the world 
uh, ev- became what it is today with all the organisms and, and so on and so forth. As Allah tells us in the Quran, he created all kinds of creatures and even describes details about them. Like they all came from water. Some fly, some have two legs, some have four, some, you know, do this, do that. I mean, there's, there's some interesting details in the Quran about the nature of creatures and organisms. Um, so how would we frame this third position of intelligent design from a uh, Islamic theological perspective in your opinion? Yeah, well, uh, First of all, I'm not opposed to the word creationism. Um, I don't think it's a bad word. Like, uh, as far as creation, you know, Allah created the universe. He created everything in it. Um, I think that there are people associated or groups associated with creationism, but again, like, it's a broad term. So I'm not allergic to that term per se. But um, that aside, like, I think it's not, I don't think it's very hard, like, to see the world and understand the world very plainly based on what the Quran and Sunnah hadith describe. I think that, you know, if you are a Muslim, and and we already had this discussion about how being a Muslim can be rationally justified and so on and so forth in our previous uh, discussion on your podcast, but um, if you are a Muslim, then you should take uh, the words of Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as description of reality, right? This is what reality is. And you should have more confidence in that as a description of reality than, you know, speculation, even within science, even within whatever discipline. Um, you know, and there are many reasons uh, that you can bring for that. And you can actually get very deep. Uh, with it but just on on the surface level well look science is constantly in flux um it's changing even within physics the hard sciences quote unquote you have major changes um between uh, newtonian physics einsteinian relativity now string theory quantum loop gravity there is all it's it's very speculative in the grand scheme of things at that higher epistemological level and so as a Muslim, I feel very confident and comfortable reading what Allah has said, what my creator and the master of the universe has said, this is the way it is, right? This is the way the world is. And of course, it's, you know, if I want to know how to, you know, turn on my laptop or, you know, do something technical and those kinds of details, yeah, I mean, there, those are technical disciplines and fields uh, that deal with those minutiae, but the bigger picture and the bigger understanding of, of what the world is, what it's about, where it came from, where it's going, what's going to happen to it, what's going to happen to us. I'm very confident and comfortable, alhamdulillah, being able to read uh, what my Lord and Master has said about that. Um, and, and so I think that's the posture and the orientation that Muslims should have Generally, you know, you should have much more confidence in these very plain descriptions. And, and you mentioned hadith and ayat. And I don't think it should be uh, a source of any kind of crises of faith or um, or conflict. If, if anything, it should be, uh, you know, a... a, a a foundation for self-generating approach to science exactly. like we've seen in the Islamic civilization. Muslims never had a problem with scientific inquiry and, and finding evidence for uh, physical um, processes in the world, understanding the relationship between cause and effects. I mean, uh, yeah, I agree with you that we have this, we have to have this paradigm. We have to have our first principles and really take them seriously. And, understand them on their own terms instead of being like, okay, well, this is what science says. This is what uh, John Q. Scientist has uh, established, you know, accor- with, according to his methods. So that's what what's real. And then let's interpret, uh, let's see if uh, the Quran matches that. If not, well, it must be a metaphor and, you know, let's uh, just in- interpret it that way to, to solve that, uh, to reconcile that. No, I, I don't think that should be. That's not. Uh, it's not a compelling approach. It's not an epistemologically sound approach, or not a sound methodology. Or it should be the other way around. Just like, like you described, we have we have we're firmly established in our worldview, and, and you know in, in our 
and, and what Allah has said about what the world is. Okay, and then we can uh, evaluate different sciences and uh, direct our investigations accordingly. I think that's that's much more uh, consistent. So what I'm hearing you say is you're concerned with this idea of, you know, okay, let's take what's already out there and somehow um, Islamify it or, or Islam and make a, a process of Islamization towards whatever current science there is. I mean, that is useful from time to time, but you're also saying, no, we should also have this um, intention or aspiration to build paradigms and models of understanding reality and all the sciences from these um, first principles of of our deen. There's actually nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it would probably be a lot more cohesive and harmonious with the theological tenets that believers currently accept if they identify with, with their beliefs. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, it's just, it definitely adds to harmony and a consistent worldview as opposed to a kind of fractured view that many Muslims have today where, okay, we have, there is science and science's description of reality. And then there's an, a Islamic uh, view of reality. And really we don't bother to s even see if they're reconcilable because they're completely different domains. And then, so we don't, we can avoid all of those problems altogether. And there's sophisticated ways to say that, okay, well, we have the seen realm and that's where science is important. And then you have the unseen realm, the ghaib, um, which is just purely, um, the Quran and Sunnah are concerned with, and we don't need to worry about reconciling the two and we can live as modern people in the world and not bother ourselves thinking about these issues. But that doesn't work, right? That fractured, ontology doesn't work because you have the Quran and the Sunnah talking about physical things and historical things that happened physically in the seen world. And there are many aspects, there are many things that are mentioned in the Quran that are, they're not technically ghaib, or even if they're of the ghaib, they still interact and can be perceived. They can be uh, experienced. Um, you know, the fact that the uh, sea was parted for Musa, for Moses, right? That's something that happened in the physical world. So there should be, you know, if, uh, you know, if we were there around that time, we should see evidence, we would see evidence of that happening physically, right? Um, it, it would have an impact on the physical world. And actually you do have Islamic, um, thinkers and uh, scholars of the past who would go and see, search for signs of, of the parting of the sea, for example, or would mm. look for, um, you know, the where... Noah's Ark. Yeah, exactly. Like the Safina of Nuh, Islam. They would actually, okay, yeah, of course, Allah is describing things that have happened historically and they had an effect. So let's go um, find those out. And, but if you have this kind of fractured ontology, okay, okay, this is what we read about in the Quran. That's like, you know, personal belief. It has nothing to do with what's really real, which is right. science. Yeah, that's not very compelling. And it's, I think, incomplete faith if that's how you view the world. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's, it's, it's tough to, um, to say, at least from my perspective, like, okay, let science do science and let theology do theology. And I can just uh, separate the two in my head because then what happens is sometimes your theological beliefs or, or religious understanding becomes more allegorical, more archetypal, more symbolic. Like, oh, well, does it matter if Adam was created in heaven and sent, came down or he evolved, you know, from a branch of, of other populations or not? In the end of the day, the story's still true and we still have to, you know, yeah. be aware still of this. spiritual benefit, yeah. But it's yeah, I mean that's 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 a possible outcome, right? Of of being like, oh, these two, I can just separate them and and honor them as their own system. But you're you're saying, well, it's not that simple because number one, science does not deal with the unseen, and it probably never will because it's built on empiricism, right? Only that which we can access and test, and and so on and so forth. And so there's always going to be this huge dimension that is not considered in any of these methodologies of science, 
right? Um, but then on the other hand, it's like, well, who, you can't also um, measure metaphysics, right? Or understand those things uh, unless, you know, you hang out with a certain certain types of, uh, you know, Muslims out there, you, you may have a different story. How would how do you reconcile this as someone who is firm in his iman of, of Islam, as well as you're, you know, you study science, you're into science and philosophy. I mean, how do you reconcile this? What what would you say is the position going back to the the three options I gave uh, as possible perspectives and positions? How, how do you what would be your kind of summary of all of this to um, help people understand the coherence of, you know, honoring science as well as honoring Islam at once? Uh, well, I'm not really worried about honoring science, <laughs> to be frank. Um you know, I, I've studied enough science and studied enough philosophy of science and history of science uh, where my view is the emperor doesn't really have much clothes on. Um, but I mean, I know other, I know Muslims, well, some Muslims will find that scandalous, but they'll be turned yeah, off. Yeah, they'll be turned, yeah, off, turned off by, by it, that. but whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, we can talk about that. I mean, that's a bigger discussion. But I mean, I also don't like discount the value of science um, in producing technology or medicine or things like that, but it's a very, uh, it's much smaller in scope. Yeah, science uh, and technology, science helps us do things very practically, pragmatically, but is it something that can really tell us, uh, answer some of these deeper questions uh, about God, about uh, meaning, and about w- our position as human beings, and even historically, like what has happened historically, can science really access that? The past, right, is by definition not accessible to our senses, right? We have memories, but that's not our senses, right? So um, I think that science is very limited in scope, but if we put it on this pedestal, which naturalism does as an alternative to religion and as an alternative to that understanding of the world, then that's what causes confusions. And I don't think it's, it's justified. So yeah, science, keep it in its place, right? Um, and it's not this amazing grand system of, of figuring out the way the world works and advancing human knowledge and progress of human civilization and all of these, you know, this narrative that uh, is very popular um, in the West in the past uh, 200 years, it's it's bogus. Um, so I don't think Muslims should buy into that. Unfortunately, there's a there's been a very deliberate program to get us to buy into this narrative because it means that western civilization is superior and in a position of uh might and strength because oh well the west has been scientific and has discovered the scientific method at least when it comes to like modern technology um so muslims need to catch up right this is what Muslims uh, at the turn of the 19th century were concerned with um, is oh we're being colonized <laughs> how are we how are we getting our butts whooped <laughs> right um, how can we catch up it must be because we don't have science science is the key um, and uh, so that you have mad- uh, madrasas being abolished uh, ulama being defunded and instead, like these other institutions being developed that not really generating any science, more like just teaching and indoctrinating materialism and, and secularism and so forth. But that, that was the underlying belief is that, okay, if we want to advance as a civilization, we're behind because we don't have science. In reality, like this whole question of why the Muslim world fell behind very obvious like the muslim world didn't have access to north and south america and enslaving two whole continents and taking all of their natural resources by force like that's why europe was able to advance um and get so far ahead of the muslim world civilizationally it was just like it's a very clear anthropological answer to that like it's you have more resources (laughs) Uh, it's not some some secret formula that the most that Europeans discover that Muslims didn't have. Like Muslims didn't think, oh, we need to investigate the world. No, that's historically not the case. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, there's also there's also some evidence to suggest Muslims were crossing to the Americas before the Europeans as well. I mean, Columbus had Arabs on his vessel with compasses, from from what I learned in university, in a course called the uh, History of Latin America. That was, you know, in in UMass Boston. But I want to challenge you though, because some people go, well, you know, I've read about the Ottoman Empire, and we know, for example, they, you know, got a little arrogant in their height, if you will. And, uh, you know, said, oh, we don't need any in- more inventions or innovations like the printing press and gunpowder and, you know, how Napoleon, when he landed in Egypt, he wiped out the Mamluks because they were still fighting with swords and he had cannons. So, I mean, science does play a role and technology does play a role in advancement, too. And sometimes our theological beliefs can hold us back in some circumstances. I mean, that's also uh, evident. No, oh, I don't I don't buy that. No, I don't buy that. I think that's just a convenient explanation used by uh, secularists, uh, naturalists to kind of justify and and self-aggrandize themselves uh, uh, epistemologically. Uh, That's not the case. Like, there's two factors or there's two possible stories here. Okay. Um, The advancement, uh, the technological superiority, that could be because, you know, something, you know, the secret formula namely the scientific method was discovered in you know by the minds of the europeans the enlightened minds uh post enlightenment europeans discovered the scientific method and that uh catapulted them to the heights of technological advancement that they continue to enjoy to this day vis-a-vis the rest of the world okay that's one narrative other narrative is okay you can get advanced technology you can get power and the ability to impose your might violently through material means like if you have more resources if you have more money if you have more um you know human power then you can achieve that and so you have a very small continent uh taking advantage and and having access to two entire continents north and south america of human power and material power. And if you, with the right historical conditions, that can lead to this kind of advancement without there being like some kind of underlying secret that has caused that. Um, I think I find that compelling. I find that narrative far more accurate and compelling. And and partly because the the scientific method, the so-called the scientific method uh, there is no such thing. Like, there's no one method that all scientists use. There's not a, one um, methodology that you find across scientific disciplines and even within scientific subdisciplines. You know, theoretical physicists in uh, material science versus theoretical physicists in quantum physics, they have very different methods. Like, there's not much that is um, the same between those two subdisciplines of theoretical physics let alone between physics and chemistry and biology and psychology or what what have you um so this idea of science uh a scientific method that was discovered like that is you know that's just myth making so so um and if the if the scientific method is just sorry, sorry if the scientific method is just like oh yeah we have hypotheses and then we observe the world and we modify our hypotheses like if that's the scientific method then everyone has right. been doing that like that's not that sophisticated or complicated of idea that it had to be discovered by uh you know uh 16th and 17th century post enlightenment Europeans if you, if I was going to reduce um, your argument to uh, what I understand to be the essence, I'm going to take a stab at it. Are you saying that basically it's greed and oppression and muscle that ha- help the Europeans advance and not necessarily a superior understanding of reality, technology, and scientific uh, uh, progress? Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of human suffering. And even like it could have been possible, like even if we take out the human suffering component, like you know, it's, it just, I don't have to make, I don't have to make a moralistic argument. Um, it's just a fact that you have more access to material and human power and it will result in what we saw historically. Um, obviously there was a ton of human oppression, oppression and injustice, brutal violence and death and destruction, wiping out the native Americans. Yeah. That, that all, uh, occurred as well but that's not necessary to the to the larger point 
Well, you know, I've also heard the position of, you know, part of the collective trauma that struck the Muslim world was, of course, the invasion of the Mongols, right? Where right. they they just, you know, pretty much, um, you know, swooped through throughout Asia and, of course, established themselves in China and Southeast Asia. And then they went to Baghdad, where it was the center of the Muslim world for hundreds of years. And estimates of approximately two million people were killed. Libraries were destroyed. And you know how the story goes, right? Like the. Right. Uh, right. And so this also caused the shock. And I think it many Muslims responded with, oh, no, this is a punishment from God because of our. Um, you know, uh, uh, investment, heavy investment in the dunya and science and, and all of these things and the arts. And then that kind of resulted in people becoming, um, you know, more, um, I don't know, ascetic or more orthodox in the religiosity. Uh, and, and that's some, sometimes one way historians say, like, why Muslims became stagnant, you know, because this was oh. what this was a ripple effect. And of course, there's colonization afterwards and, and all these things. But, you know, that was one yeah. of the, the big breaking points for the Islamic civilization. I mean, that's when it took a huge, a huge hit besides, of course, uh, the Crusades as well, which was, you know, um, what, over 150 years of, of waves of invasions coming down too. So, I mean, yeah. there, there's a lot of things going on historically. I, I don't know if many people would agree with, you know, uh, s some of the points you made, but I'd love to hear your, your response. Yeah, I'd agree. I was with you up until you said, like, oh, there was increased religiosity and asceticism, and that caused, <laughs> that caused like, uh, us to take a step back as a civilization, as Muslim civilization. Like, why does it always have to go to that? <laughs> like, why do we, why are historians, uh, Western historians so keen to associate uh, being religious with being backwards and anti, uh, technological, right. anti progress? So it uh, always I mean, comes yeah. up in all of these explanations. So I have to like chuckle when, it, when it does because it's not necessary. Like it, and the Mongol invasion is explanatory enough. <laughs> like that kind of, death and destruction is explanatory enough like to explain how it can negatively impact the ability to advance uh certain technologies we don't need to like attack on like oh and the, then the muslims also felt like they need to be like more ascetic and not pursue the dunya and yeah i, I don't know i don't yeah I, I don't necessarily i don't necessarily buy it either i'm just saying this is a position I, right. i've yeah, sometimes heard right you're saying no that that's not necessarily the only response or outcome to experiencing some invasions or other nations having more military uh, might or resources that's it's not always the response to just go okay let's just reclude into religiosity and matters of the unseen and and just not deal with the dunya because the dunya is cursed anyways you know that you're, you're is that what you're saying yeah let me like clarify like i don't disagree with the idea that um, Muslims had reached a point of decadence at that time in history and a punishment from Allah was that you had the Mongol invasion. Like, yeah, that idea in itself is not problematic as far as I'm concerned. Um, and in the Quran, we know of many civilizations that Allah has told us about historically that reached this point of extravagance and decadence and immorality that they were then hit with disaster and calamity uh, and, and being wiped out essentially. Um, so that I have no like issue with that idea. My issue was like that as an explanation for this larger question or not larger, but this separate question of, well, why did, uh, why is, why did Europe reach this point of technological advancement that the Muslim world didn't? I just don't feel like adding this component of oh it was because they became more concerned with god or they became more religious or they became more religiously conservative or whatever else like um kind of explanations that are put forth i don't think that's compelling or necessary mm -hmm. if that makes sense no no i think that's that's clarified oh yeah one other point that i want to bring up is um just for muslims who are struggling like um uh, with this idea because I mean, I've been reading about this stuff and thinking about it for over a decade. And so I've, I've come to like certain conclusions and like a certain perspective and someone who hasn't gone through that might be listening to this and think, okay, yeah, so what you're crazy <laughs> or, you know, I don't like how you're anti-science. Yeah, yeah. You're and <laughs> you're, you're a, what's it called? Um, conspiracy theorist and all this stuff. <laughs> 
wow, Kareem, those, uh, those uh, labels came you know, flowing out of you. Is, <laughs> is this what you think? <laughs> my, my job is to try to understand people and different perspectives, right. and I can certainly um, – you know, uh, see how some people would go, well, well, okay, so what's, you know, so what exactly is your position? You know, it's still a little ambiguous. Is it all just, you know, oh, the Muslims are always, you know, good and great and dandy, and we're just victims of horrible propaganda and, and unfortunate oppression? I mean, you know, clarify for us. So so what would you like to uh, to add as far as... Wait, what, um, what was ambiguous? That's, I don't understand. What was ambiguous? Like Allah created uh, the entirety of the universe as he describes it, um, he created human beings, our father, Adam, I, uh, and his spouse from his rib. They were in Jannah, um, Iblis, uh, the, the, um, Malaika were told to prostrate, um, to Adam, Iblis refused. So yeah, we have all those details, right? And that, so. Sure. No, but I'm, I'm talking, but I'm talking specifically about explained away the importance or or weightiness of modern science you know uh, at least that's how it sounded and that's why i think it's a little ambiguous it's like okay so what how should we see science you know is it fine is it science isn't something that is absolute it's not theology it's obviously not going to give us all the answers but could you also um you know some people might go well that's the same thing about religion at large, it can't give you all the answers. There's a lot of answers, but there's still things that are mystery. Because some people might see it as you're just a reductionist of science, or you don't think science, um, sh- sure, it shouldn't be on this pedestal, as you explained, but then, okay, so then where should it be in our everyday lives, in our theological uh, understanding, in our approach to ourselves, existence? Um, you did say, yeah, it's important when it comes to medicine, when tech, certain technological advancements, right? But there's a lot of stuff there that you don't feel is reliable when it comes to the scientific worldview as it's framed today. Is, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, well, we, we talked about it, right? We talked about the origins of life and humanity and species. Like, there, I have, it's not like um, I'm just uh, antagonistic toward science because I'm. Uh, a literalist fundamentalist no like my critiques and opinion of science are based on just investigating and thinking about and reading about and researching science itself and does it cut mustard like does it live up to the hype and through my study the answer is no like some of these grander narratives of science definitely not if we go into the specifics of evolutionary biology definitely definitely not um, and, uh, you know, there's all this other, uh, uh, many other people saying the same thing. Um, so I don't really understand like, what's the ambiguity with my view. So no, as that, far as, that like, okay, that, science, that my, my, my problem is not like, oh, science can't understand everything. Therefore science is you know, not reliable. No, that's not my okay. position at all. Like it, there's all kinds of independent reasons we we were just focused on evolutionary biology, but if you and even there we just scratched the surface in terms of all the critiques that are available. And if people are interested, like I recommend, you know, uh, my writing. Uh, I mentioned one book, but if you go to my website, MuslimSkeptic.com, I have a reading list. There's a lot of material there, um, essays that I've written where I go into depth on uh, some of these claims that I'm making, and and there's too much to get across in a podcast. But and I'm div- I'm continuing to write a lot on, on these questions because I think they're of high importance to Muslims because we're at this stage where we need to understand okay where does our, our faith um, intersect and interplay with this other major source of knowledge purported right. source of knowledge which right. is science and okay Islam is a source of knowledge. Uh, Quran and Sunnah is a source of knowledge, and then you have science. Okay, well, what is the interaction there, interplay there? And I don't think, I, I haven't come across many Muslim intellectuals and writers of the, of the mo- of modern times who have provided much compelling perspectives on this, frankly. Um, there's a lot of deference uh, by Muslims to science, and that, as I described earlier, I think that's misplaced. So I think there is a need for Muslim intellectuals and philosophers to 
take a more critical approach, more skeptical approach uh, to science and study the philosophy of science, study the history of science, ask these questions and uh, d let's develop, you know, our, our response and our reaction. And, you know, there's a, there's a deconstruction aspect to that or a critical component, a negative component of that. Um, and we wouldn't be alone because there's all kinds of people of all backgrounds doing the same thing in different parts of the world, different disciplines. Um, but there's also a, a positive and constructive aspect of it as well, because if you're able to put science in its rightful place and delimit it correctly and accurately, then that opens up uh, your ability to see uh, so much in creation in the world that science hasn't been able to explain and, and is not even close to explaining. And it can provide great boost in Iman, great boost in your conviction and Yaqeen in Islam. You start reading the Quran, you know, and, and not thinking, oh, well, because sometimes people will read the Quran. And I experienced this too, uh, you know, when I was younger, before I had uh, gone through this path. You read the Quran and you read a verse. And it's like, okay, should I understand this literally or metaphorically? And part of the problem is, you know, not having a solid basis in Arabic, which, you know, most Muslims today don't have. But it's also like, even those who do have a solid basis in Arabic, okay, well, we have all this science that says something different. So I guess this is like, it's just a question mark. At best, it's just a question mark. Uh, at worst, yeah, this is all just, you know, metaphorical. And you, you refer to this earlier, but that has a big impact on your faith because, okay, is your reality, is your understanding of what is real predicated and based on that bedrock of uh, Quranic understanding of the world right, or right. not? <laughs> Right, it makes a big difference for a person's iman. So th this is why this is such an important question. And then the other point, like as a final point, um, if there's no other issue, questions, is that um, people have a hard time reconciling. Okay, well, how could, how can we see a human being being generated from nothing? Like that just seems so unscientific. This, that seems like so contrary to reason that you could have a human being. Adam or Sam just have not be born biologically. All life should come from life, right? Um, and then to respond to that and to give some um, uh, perspective on that, you know, consider that science, modern science, believes that the universe in its entirety came from nothing, right? And was just uh, created, you know, came through a big bang. Right. So if you can, if science accepts that and believes that with a straight face, then how how is it hard to understand that a human being, which is much less of a creation, is much less of a entity or being than all of the entire universe? How is it hard to believe that that could, you know, be created by Allah, you know, in whatever way that uh, He sees fit? It, I just don't see the intellectual tension there. And, you know, when Allah says in the Quran, right. Are, are you a greater creation? Are you more difficult to create? Or the sky? Uh, he created it, right? And, and so this is, I think, it puts into perspective uh, the question of human origins in light of the origin of all of creation. So that's one thing that I would just say to help Muslims struggling with this. No, I think I think you you did a good job of clarifying. Again, you know, I just want to make sure, you know, your position is is clearly understood. You know, because I think you have a lot to offer. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's like consistent. If I believe Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created all of the universe from nothing, why couldn't He create Adam alayhi from His own two hands in the way that He described? It's not far fetched. And it kind of reminded me of the beautiful example of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiAllahu anhu when Quraysh came to him. After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, had the Isra'ul Ma'raj, and they're like, hey, do you hear what your buddy's saying now? You know, that he traveled, you know, through the universes and went to Jerusalem and, and one night and came back. I mean, come on, like, are you really buying this? And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is exemplifying 
exactly what you're talking about. He said, well, I believe in something greater than that. I believe he receives revelation from, from seven heavens from the creator of the universe. So why wouldn't I be able to accept that he got on a buraq and traveled with uh, Jibreel to uh, uh, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is also confirmed in Surah Al-Najm, by the way, uh, and and then uh, went to Jerusalem and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I kind of almost see this as spiritual logic or religious logic, if you will. Like, yeah, of course... If you accept this, then you can accept that. Yeah, it's it's logic. It's logic at its core. I mean, just reflect on the depth of wisdom and logic and rationality and and also conviction, right? Uh, that Abu Bakr radiallahu an uh, demonstrated and expressed in this. Because when you think, I think this is a perfect analogy for what we're talking about. Because Look at who who's accusing him and who's like raising this. So, oh, look at what your you know what Muhammad has said. Sorry, Sam. What he has said about what he's what he's done, as if like it's so obvious that oh, of course no one could travel to you know uh, Aqsa to Jerusalem and then to the heavens. How impossible! Like, what is that based on? Like, how do you know it's impossible? Like, what have you you know? Do you have access to revelation? Like, do you? Because they believed in Allah, right? They believed in Allah. Um, many of the mushrikeen believed in Allah, actually. So they they have, they have that conception. But w- on what basis do you have this doubt? Uh, do you presume to know exactly everything about the way the world is and the, the way the universe works and what's possible what, and conceivable? Like how arrogant and how stupid, like it, illogical, right? Um, so why would I, and that's the same, that's a perfect, uh, parallel and analog to what, uh, you know, science today, right? It's so limited. It's such a small sliver of, um, what exists and cause science doesn't know what it doesn't know. Right. Okay. It's so before, uh, you know, the discovery of x-rays and electromagnetic waves, right? Human beings had no conception that the entire uh, world around them was filled with all of this electromagnetic radiation. And that it's it's completely like if you see pictures from NASA, right? And they have like these... um, uh, images that they capture where they're detecting, okay, what are, what's the radio, uh, signals coming from the sun? What's the infrared spectrum that's coming from the sun? What's the ultraviolet, you know, all these different ranges within the electromagnetic spectrum. And you get completely different images, right? And depending on what part of the electromagnetic spectrum you're you're detecting and, and you're exploring. And so that's literally like you have different aspects of the world that were revealed to you like that you had you were not privy to in the least just 200 wow. years ago just 150 years ago but you're still like waxing poetic and strutting around like you know like what the universe is all about and oh we just have to figure out these small little details but it's pretty much all solved no that's so arrogant and illogical like on just even if we weren't even if someone wasn't coming from a theistic or muslim perspective it would be illogical Logical, it'd be irrational, but this is exactly what they're peddling to people, and it's just it's beyond faith. It's just stupidity. And so when I hear you know this narration about Abu Bakr, it just fills me with wonder and gratitude. Like this is the you know these are the Sahaba, these are the uh, Muslims that we aspire to be, both you know externally with our actions, but also internally and their understanding. So yeah, that's a very apt. Um, thing that you're bringing up here in this discussion yeah and subhanallah those that same generation changed the world forever so they probably knew something <laughs> <laughs> yeah to say the least <laughs> <laughs> to say the least yeah subhanallah yeah. daniel um always a pleasure uh, to have you on and and um really interesting topic and of course we we uh it's hard to do justice to to some of these um subject matters and uh may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us and of course i hope people uh, reflect and um, uh, you know do their own uh, research and learning and and I think part of wisdom is to also accept humility and the mystery and that you know some things uh, can't fully be known and if we are going to put our chips on on the table for something uh, obviously if you're a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger uh, that's probably the safest bet to make you know as far as this is the narrative that we want to uh, 
uh, use and harness to help us construct reality and not the other way around. Yeah, welcome to the listeners as well. Thank you for having me. Inshallah, see you. Allah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Kareem Sirajuddin here. Thank you for tuning in. Please visit nurhuman.com to learn more about how I provide personal, spiritual, and relationship counsel. Please generously help sponsor the show to keep on going at patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. That's patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem.